everybody would be definitely distressed given the previous circumstances. So they went to an astrologer at that time. And, they, and that astrologer said, no, this person, uh, there is, uh, you will give birth to this, um, to this person, but this is not just any ordinary person. This person will actually save the entire universe. So the astrologer already get, had given them that information uh, at that time. So just a little bit more information about who is Lord Chaitanya. So we actually see many different descriptions of Lord Chaitanya even before he actually appears. So uh, the, earlier this week, Rupanuga Prabhu, he was giving class uh, at the ISKCON Toronto and he was reciting the story that I had this Leela that actually one time Radharani, she was having a dream and uh, she told Krishna about this dream the next day. She says that in this dream, I saw this person and he reminded me exactly of you. And he had this, uh, I, all the feelings that I normally have, she was a little bit distressed because she says, all the feelings I normally have for you, I was having for this person, but it wasn't you. This person had a whitish complexion, right? So this person had a whitish complexion. And, and this was 4,500 years, this dream was 4,500 years before Mahaprabhu actually appeared. So, and then that's when Krishna actually said that this actually form that you're seeing, this whitish complexion, that's actually me. And that's actually why you feel this way, is because that's actually me. So we understand that the Mahaprabhu is actually, he's none other than in his most unique incarnation because in the other avatar, in the other avatars, Krishna comes, you know, obviously there's different forms that he comes in. We know Narsimha, Varahaha, again, different forms. But in this specific form, he actually is the only form that comes as both Radha and Krishna. Right? So internally, his mood is Radharani and externally, he appears to be uh, a male body, right? And so that's actually, uh, externally he appears to be as Krishna. And the reason why, it's explained that when Mahaprabhu came, there was, a, there was an external mission and there was an internal mission. And so exter like internally his mission was that he came specifically because he always saw Radharani giving him worship. And when there is the worship and the one who's worshiping, it's, it's a little bit difficult. Krishna says that I actually don't know how you feel as a worshiper. So Krishna actually wanted to say, what is this bhakti, this bhava that Radharani is feeling when she is worshiping me? And so that is actually why internally the mood of Mahaprabhu is as Radharani because he actually wanted to feel what it was like to be Radharani. Uh, the, she, he wanted to feel the bhava of Radharani, that, that bhakti that she was feeling, because as one who was being worshipped, he never had that opportunity. So this was his, he wanted to come to actually feel what that was, you know, what that was like. And externally, we know, obviously, we see what, what Mahaprabhu did externally. He essentially came to, to, to fulfill the order and the request of Advaita Charya, to basically help the fallen conditioned souls. And how did he actually do that? He actually do that by actually distributing uh, prema or love of God to everybody, regardless of circumstance or position in life. And he did that through by uh, through distribution of the holy name of Krishna. And so, just a couple of small stories from when he was young is that during the Anaprasa. Uh, Prashna ceremony. So that's usually at six months, and it's usually for the child when they receive their first grains. Is that he during this ceremony? We we know that uh, typically on top of offering the first grains, they always there's a one specific thing that's done is to pr to actually see the inclination of a child. They actually present the child with a, uh, some options of what to choose. So in this situation, they offered uh, Nimai. Uh, they offered Nimai some coins and the Srimad Bhagavatam. And immediately Nimai went to the Srimad Bhagavatam, right? So again, it's also already here showing the inclination of, of Mahaprabhu during this actual ceremony, just when he was, you know, very, very little. And so the reason why he's named Nimai, so that this Nimai, we hear many different names for, for Mahaprabhu, and his early age uh, name was Nimai. And the reason why it was Nimai, this was the, 
the name given to him by his mother because he was born under a Nimba tree. And so that's why he has the name Nima. And there's this really nice story. It was actually just reminding me of my own work. But uh, I thought this was really endearing. But that when uh, Nimai was really little, he would sit in his mother's lap. And there would be times where he would cry. And the ladies that were around him, they would clap. And they would actually be chanting the Maha Mantra. Right? And when they would be chanting the Maha Mantra, immediately Mahaprabhus would, would stop crying. Nimai would stop crying. And so the neighbors, the neighbors, and everybody, they would actually, they would actually observe us, and they were, it was, they were, they were surprised, but they were also looking and very in reverence. They're saying, "Wow, this, this." Whenever Nimai cries, as soon as they chant the holy name, he stops. So then the Nimai actually, what the what these ladies used to do is they they used to make him cry on purpose, right? They used to make him cry on purpose just to get him to stop crying by chanting the holy name. So here already we see that Nimai's preaching started at a very young age, right? Even when he was a child, he said he was already putting emphasis on this chanting of the holy name. And obviously because that is Leela, it's, you know, many people would say you're making a baby cry. That's, uh, that's not a good thing. But here, you know, in, in Mahabharata's Leela, we see that this was actually his way of encouraging everybody to chant, right? And, and for those people that actually didn't have faith in the holy and they'd say, oh, we, we, we chant this name, people, baby, stop crying, let's do this for everybody, right? And, uh, you know, I was just connecting it to what I do day to day at work because I deal with a lot of babies. And, and I'll just share a story, actually, when uh, Sashima, she's, uh, she's here, when her granddaughter was born, I was actually at the, the delivery. They called me because there were some, some issues. And so I saw her in the waiting room, and I, I was just totally surprised. And she, she said, uh, I, I mean, I didn't know why she was there, because I didn't know what the room I was going into. And uh, she said, my, my, uh, my daughter-in-law, she's giving uh, birth right now, and she's just in the room. I said, oh, I'm supposed to go in that room. And she said, she said, make sure you chant. I said, don't worry. I said, that happens to all the babies. As soon as they, you know, as soon as they come out, that's the first thing that I do when I do my, my examination of the baby. I have, I've done it in such a way, Krishna has blessed me in such a way that I can do it in such a way that the parents can be looking at me and I can be holding the baby and I can do it. Sometimes there's a mask on my face and there's not. But anyways, there's always a way to go right into the ear of the baby to chant. And, you know, we consider this, I'm considered as a very fortunate service because we're starting their, hopefully, their spiritual life. And even some nurses have noticed, they said, uh, uh, they say, you know, Dr. Patel, sometimes we look at you and it looks like you're actually praying for this baby. And they don't know what I'm doing, but that's actually what I'm doing, right? <laughs> you know, actually, one of my godbrothers... One of my godbrothers, he said, he said, you're actually, uh, he said, you're actually their, you know, their guru. I said, no, 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 I can't accept that kind of responsibility, right? Because but, here, here you're doing when the, when the child is born, but uh, Krishna is coming around to Prabhu, you know, in the Toronto temple, yes? Yeah. The Prabhupada is saying, he is, uh, sometimes he has to handle with the kids, those who are dying also. So before yeah, uh, yeah. crossing away, he did uh, chant the mother. Mm -hmm. So here he's uh, born and... <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a tremendous service. And I've actually seen, you know, for me, the reason why this story actually had so much, em uh, like, uh, touched me so much is because my own uh, experience is that actually when this name is chanted to babies that have been crying, they, they, you can actually see they become dira, they become a little bit, you know, like peaceful, right, when the, when the holy name is chanted. So for me, it actually also increases my own faith. It's not because of there's any qualification from myself, but actually the power of the name is there, right, it's for all of us to actually uh, make an attempt and try. So I thought I was thinking about this story, and then I was thinking about this story, and I was thinking, you know, this is such a nice thing to be able to bring up on this occasion. Because Nimai, again, he was very little, but look, it, they did it just to stop him from crying, right? And uh, so we know that when, when Mahaprabhu, he was older, he went by the name of Vishwambar, right? So that was Vishwambar, and his older brother was named Vishwarup. And I actually just recently learned the, name, the, the meaning of Vishwambar. Vishwambar actually means one who maintains the entire universe and who leads all living entities. So what a, an amazing and fitting name for 
Mahaprabhu is, is one who maintains the entire universe and, and leads the all living entities, right? So we just meditate on this. It's such an auspicious and fitting name for Mahaprabhu for what he, for what he did. And so we know actually that when Mahaprabhu was around, when he was on this earth, he actually, outside of very specific instances, no one actually knew outside of you know, his intimate associates that he was actually Krishna himself. He never claimed to be Krishna, but the Shastra, uh, it actually, it, or it actually uh, predicts that Mahaprabhu was. And I'll read the one verse from Srimad Bhagavatam. It says, Krishna Varanam. You, you know this verse? Hey, no, 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 please can speak. I don't actually know it by memory. If you, if you know it by memory, you can speak. Yeah, so it's Krishna Varanam, Triksha Krishnam, Sangha Pongastra, Parshdam. Yagya hi sankirtam praya, yagya ti hi sumedesa. So, in the age of Kali, intelligent persons perform congregational chanting to worship the incarnation of Godhead, who constantly sings the name of Krishna. Although his complexion is not blackish, he is Krishna himself. He is accompanied by his associates, servants, weapons, and confidential companions. So, that's the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, 11th canto, 5th chapter, 32nd verse. So, again, we see that the reason why, the reason why, and this is really the main point to emphasize here with Mahaprabhu's uh, appearance and just his level of compassion is that he actually came to really give the highest goal, right? The Sri Mabhagavad says the highest goal is Prema Pumarto Mahan, right? To love God. And so he actually came to give that to the people who necessarily weren't following rules and regulations, right? And, and he came to give that to, to everybody, regardless of male or female, whatever position you had in society, how, whatever, how much, whatever your bank balance was, that didn't matter. Whatever occupation you did, that didn't matter. Everybody was getting, giving, uh, giving love of Krishna. And so we see that in, in, when Krishna came, what, he, what was his kind of offering and purpose? It was to, to establish his Vrindavan Leela and to give the Mahabharata.